everybody, I'm Matthew Laria. You're watching the Faith for Life broadcast. Let's pray and release faith over today's broadcast and then we'll get right into the word. Father, we do thank you today, Lord, for your word. We ask you today for revelation of it. We ask you for grace and help to receive it, to put it into practice and to see it work in our lives. And Father, we do thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Now we've been doing a series on the broadcast entitled, So Long Sorrow. And on today's broadcast, this will be the last teaching in this series. And so again, friend, I just wanna encourage you, you can go back to mam.tv or YouTube or Facebook and watch any of the broadcasts that you miss. And on our website, mam.tv, you can download the notes that I'm using for the broadcast as well to help you in your study time. And let me encourage you, if you've missed any of the broadcast, go back and watch because the Lord has really been helping us in this series. Now, I want to start today's broadcast over in Psalm 127. Now, our foundation text was in Proverbs 15, 13, and that verse said that a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And again, that is sorrow's purpose, and that's, that's what you need to remember about sorrow, that its purpose is to break your spirit so that you cannot function spiritually, so that you can't do anything for God, so that you can't walk in victory and overcome in adversity. Now, on today's broadcast, I wanna to talk to you about the importance of rejoicing. Why rejoice? And we start here in Psalm 127, verse two. It says this, it says, it is vain. The word vain there means it is destructive, it is evil, it's youth, useless, it's worthless, it's nothingness. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. What is sorrow? It's vain. It's youth, useless, it's worthless, it's nothingness, it's destructive, it's evil. See, friends, sorrow is a destructive and dangerous waste of time. Sorrow is a dangerous waste of time. Uh, at the end of uh, the broadcast last time, we talked about Hannah and how she wanted to have a baby and how sad she was and how she was yielding to sorrow year after year. And we mentioned how that sorrow got her no closer to her answer. It did nothing to help her. It was a dangerous waste of time. You know, sorrow is a lot like worry. It will add nothing good to you. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 6, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? What he was saying to them is worrying is not going to help you get your needs met. It's not going to add anything to you. Well, sorrow falls into that category. It is not going to add anything to you. I mean, how does it help you to just sit there and be sad and sorrowful? How does that help you? How does that get you closer to your answer? While you're doing that, you're not seeking God. You're not trusting Him. You're not doing what He tells you to do. And so just sitting there and being sorrowful is doing nothing for you. It's not helping you. It's a dangerous waste of time. You know, David and his men in 1 Samuel 30, they came back from battle and they saw that their, their homes were burned, uh, their belongings were taken, and their families were taken captive. And it says in verse 4 that David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. In verse 6 it says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters." It says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. And so, yes, certainly if you come back and your homes were burnt and your families were taken captive, feelings of sadness, 
and sorrow are going to hit you. And they hit David and they hit his men and, it, and they wept until they couldn't weep anymore. And David was distressed. But what you'll notice is that David didn't stay in that place of sorrow. He didn't let sorrow sit upon him day after day. It, it looks to it, the way that this verse reads, it looks like it didn't stay on him even for a whole day. It looked like he wept and he was distressed and then he came out of it quickly and he encouraged himself in the Lord. And then in verse eight, look what he did. It said, David inquired at the Lord saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And God answered him and said, pursue for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. And then if you read the verses, that's exactly what David did. He went and got his family and his stuff back. Now, why did I want to mention that to you? Had David stayed in that place of sorrow, he wouldn't have got any closer to his answer. Why? Because sorrow is a dangerous waste of time. Not only are you not getting closer to your answer, you're actually getting further away from your answer. Instead of, and so instead of just sitting there and being sad and being sorrowful and being heavy, he sought God instead of being sad. And then instead of being sad, he pursued his enemies. And instead of just sitting there and being sad, um, he recovered all. And so friend, you need to, you need to lay hold of this. Grab hold of this. What good does it do you to sit there and sulk and be sad and be sorrowful? Here's your answer. It does you no good. It's not going to add anything to you. What did it say in Psalm 127 verse 2? It said it's vain to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. It's useless. It's worthless. It is nothingness. And not only that, it's destructive and evil, but it's not going to get you any closer to your answer. It's a waste of time. Come on, it's a waste of time. It was a waste of time for Hannah. If David had stayed there, it would have been a waste of time for him. And so sorrow is a dangerous waste of time. Now, um, I want to talk a second about that reality of it being dangerous. We just, in the first part of that broadcast, this broadcast, we were talking about being a waste of time, how it won't add anything to you. But it goes beyond that. It's not just a waste of time, it's a dangerous waste of time. And why is that? Because when you yield to sorrow, when you let it sit on you and rest upon you, what's happening is it's working its way into your heart. And what it wants to do, again, mentioned to it, mentioned, uh, mentioned it to you many times in this series. What sorrow wants to do is it wants to get in you. And then what it'll do is it'll eat away at you like a cancer. And it will leave you a faithless, spiritless being who cannot conquer in a time of adversity. And so not only is it a waste of time, it is a dangerous waste of time. And so what do we want to do instead of just sitting there and yielding to sorrow is we want to make the choice to rejoice. And why is that? Because in adversity, one of the worst things you can do is just sit there and yield to sorrow. Forgive me, I'm, you can tell I'm looking through notes here. <laughs> um, one of the worst things you can do in a time of adversity is just sit there and yield to sorrow. And the reason why is because sorrow will break you down on the inside so that you can't overcome the adversity that you're facing. Um, the natural response in a time of adversity is to go low and to be sad and to be sorrowful. But friend, if you do that in adversity, the sorrow is going to break your spirit. And so with a broken spirit, how can you overcome that adversity? The answer is you can't. In Proverbs 18, 14, it said, the strong spirit of a man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble. And so the only way to, to overcome trouble is to have a strong spirit. But if when the trouble comes, 
you go low and get sad and yield to the sorrow, then you won't be strong to overcome the trouble. And so you can see what the enemy is after there. And so this is one of the big reasons that you and I rejoice. We rejoice because it keeps us strong on the inside. It keeps us able on the inside to overcome adversity. And that's why one of the worst things you can do in adversity is yield to sorrow and sadness. Because what it's going to do next is it's going to weaken you inside and make it impossible for you to overcome. And so what do we, this is one big reason why we rejoice, keeps us strong on the inside. You know, the scripture makes connection between joy and strength and between sadness and weakness. Let me read you a few verses. Jeremiah 49, 24 says this, Damascus is waxed feeble and turns herself to flee. And fear has seized on her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her. And so do you see the connection? Sorrows took her. She was waxed feeble. That means she was weak. And she fleed from her enemy. That's defeat. See, all those go together. What was it? It was sadness they, that sorrow had taken over her. Then what, what was next? Waxed feeble. See, that's what sorrow does. It makes you weak. And when you're weak, what do you do? You flee. You can't overcome. Let me read it to you again. Damascus is waxed feeble, turns herself to flee. Fear seized her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her. You see the pattern there. Sorrow make you weak. If you're weak, you can't overcome. Um, Nehemiah 8.10 says this, The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so when you choose to rejoice, when you choose to be glad, you get stronger on the inside. When you choose to sulk and be sad, you get weaker on the inside, and then you can't overcome. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Chronicles 16.27 says, Glory and honor are in His presence. Strength and gladness are in His place. We see those are connected. Being glad strengthens you. Gladness and strength, those two are connected. The same way sadness and being weak is connected. Psalm 19.5 says this, Rejoice as a strong man to run a race. What does a strong man do? A strong man is a rejoicing man. And so, friend, this is one big reason why you and I rejoice. It keeps us strong in here. See, the opposite, what's sorrow do? We read it in the first teaching on the, on the broadcast, and we've, we've mentioned it today. What does sorrow do? Breaks the spirit. What's it do? Weakens you on the inside. Well, flip it around. What would, what would the choice to rejoice do? That would start to strengthen you on the inside. And being strong on the inside, you could overcome in times of adversity. Sorrow breaks the spirit, but joy, joy strengthens it. Let me read you Proverbs 15, 13 again. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow or sadness of heart, the spirit is broken. And so that's what sorrow does. It'll break you down and make you weak on the inside. It's a big reason why you and I need to rejoice. It's a big reason why we should rejoice and we do rejoice It'll keep us strong in the inside, on the inside. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. And let's look at a verse over there. What are we talking about on the broadcast today? We're talking about why, why rejoice? Why rejoice? And big reason why we rejoice is because sorrow is a dangerous waste of time. That's a big reason why we rejoice. Another big reason why we rejoice is that sorrow will break you down on the inside and it'll keep you from being able to overcome adversity. But if I make the choice to rejoice, I get strong on the inside. Look at this with the master in Hebrews chapter 12, talking about Jesus. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. Now these two things are connected the joy that was set before him 
and enduring the cross. See, to endure the cross, Jesus needed to be strong. He needed to be strong on the inside to endure the pain and the suffering and the punishment. He needed to be strong. How did he stay strong? He didn't think about how bad the cross was or um, how hard it was. He didn't think about that. He thought about the joy that was set before him. The, the victory of the cross. He thought about you and me being in heaven and being saved. And thinking about that stirred his joy. And his joy made him strong so that he could overcome the stuff that he was facing. Come on, friend, do you, do you see where we're going with this? If you get sad because of your problem, you're going to be too weak to overcome your problem. So when you have the problem, don't choose to be sad. Make the choice to rejoice. And when you do, you will get stronger on the inside so that you can overcome your problem. But you can't be a sad overcomer. Come on. You, if you get sad, if you Stay, stay sad, you're going to get weak and you won't be able to overcome. And so in adversity, one of the worst things you can do is go low and get sad. And again, that's the natural thing to do. That's what most people do. That's what most Christians do. But if you do that, you're going to get weak and you're not going to be able to overcome. Uh, Proverbs 24.10 says this, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If thou faint in the day of adversity, if adversity strikes and you faint, experience defeat, why did that happen? It happened because your strength was small. Now, let's go one step farther. But why was your strength small? Now, there's a lot of things that can make you weak, but we're talking about joy and sorrow on the broadcast now. But if you faint the day of adversity, it's because your strength is small. Well, why was your strength small? Well, here it is. People fail in times of adversity because they get weak. That's why they fail. They get weak. They don't persevere. They quit believing. They quit standing. They quit, quit continuing in the word. And one of the big reasons they get weak is because they get sad and sorrowful and they don't make the choice to rejoice. One of the big reasons why people get weak in adversity is because they get sad. And if you get sad, you get weak. And if you get weak, you can't overcome. And so when it's bad, you need to make the cho choice to rejoice so that you can be strong and overcome the bad that you're facing. Remember in Job 5.22, we read it a couple broadcasts ago, at destruction and famine, you laugh. Well, why? Because if I laugh at it, I'll be strong to overcome it. If I get sad because of it, I'm going to get weak and I won't be able to overcome it. And so a big reason why you and I rejoice is to stay strong on the inside. Praise the Lord. Now, let me give you another reason why we rejoice. Um, another big reason why we rejoice is because of our faith. See, friend, when you believe God's going to do something good in your life, you're not sad about it, you're happy about it, and you rejoice. And our joy and our rejoicing is an expression of our faith. In 1 Peter 1, uh, verse 8, it says this, talking about Jesus, whom having not seen, we haven't seen him, we love him in whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And so these two are connected, believing and rejoicing. When I'm in faith and expecting God to do something good in my life, one way that it'll show up is that I have some joy about me. I have some rejoicing about me. I'm not low and sad and down because I believe God's going to do something good. And so I'm up and I'm full of joy. Romans 15, 13 talked about how the God of hope would fill us with all joy and peace in believing. And so one of the marks that you are actually in faith 
is that you have some joy about you. You have some peace about you. Um, Joel 2, chapter 21 says this, Fear not and be glad. I'm sorry, fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Why? For the Lord will do great things. And so if you believe the Lord's going to do some great things, you'll rejoice now and be glad now before the great things are there. Why? Because you know they're coming. And, and so I'm up and I'm happy. Praise God. And so if you know you've got bills to pay or believe in God for some financial needs to be met and you know he's going to come through, come on, prop the corners of your mouth up, right? I mean, put a smile on that face, brighten up because God's going to move in your behalf. And so this is another big reason for our joy and rejoicing. It is our faith. And when you're in faith and you have faith in God, joy is one of the things that shows up. Your joy tells the story about your faith. And to be joyless, listen closely, friend, to be joyless is to be faithless. I, need, I know it's simple. I need to say it to you again. To be joyless about your situation that you're facing. What that means is that you're faithless. Little joy means little faith. And what little faith will do, it'll do to you the same thing it did to Peter. It'll put you in the water ready to drown. That's what little faith does. And so make the connection between, am I trusting God? Am I in faith? What's one way I can check it? Where's my joy at? And if my joy is low, then I'm not trusting him as much as I think I may think I am. And if I am trusting him, what will happen is it'll start to bump my joy up. Why? Because I believe God's going to do something good in my behalf. And so an expression of that belief and that faith is I, I'm bright, I'm up, I'm happy, I'm joyful because God's going to move in my behalf. Praise the Lord. Um, in uh, Acts chapter 27, we're running out of time here, but I'll mention this to you. Uh, the Apostle Paul was on a ship with some men and uh, he said this to him in verse 22, uh, they were, had been stuck in a hurricane. It looked like they were going to die. And he said, Be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. That, that we're not going to lose any life, but we're going to lose the ship. He said, For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I, whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God has given you all them that sail with you. Paul said, Therefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told to me. What, what did God say to Paul? Now they're in the hurricane right now. When he's saying this to these guys. In the hurricane, Paul hears from God and God says, you're not going to die. You're going to make it through. And so Paul comes to the guys and he says, guys, cheer up. We're, God told me we're going to make it through. We're getting through this. And so they were glad before it got good why? Because they had faith in God that God was going to make it good. They're cheering up based on something God said to them that they don't see yet because of their faith in him. All they have is God's word on it. And Paul says, cheer up. Why, why was Paul so cheery? And why was he telling them to cheer up? Because he had faith in God. They were not going to be taken out by this hurricane, but they were going to make it through. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to close up. Uh, the broadcast and the series by going to Proverbs chapter 17. And I want to look here at verse 22. Um, three big reasons why we rejoice. Number one, sorrow is a dangerous waste of time. Number two, we rejoice to stay strong on the inside. And then number three, why do we rejoice? Because we have faith in God that he's going to help us, deliver us, whatever it may be. Now, Proverbs 17, 22 says this, A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bone. A merry heart does good like a medicine. The word medicine there means a cure. It also means in the, in the ancient Hebrew, a lifting high of, some, of something or the lifting of an illness. And friend, I wanted, you, I wanted to read that verse to you in closing out this series because I want you to understand that so often in so many situations, Joy is the cure. What did that scripture say? A merry heart does good like a medicine. 
And in so many situations, when we choose to be glad and choose to rejoice, so often that is the cure. That is when things begin to shift. Whenever you, when you choose to be glad and choose to rejoice, you get into faith. You get to a place where you can hear from God. You get to a place where God can, can move in your behalf and have access into your life. And so often that shift starts with rejoicing and joy and that merry heart being the cure. That's when it turn, started to turn around. It started to turn around when I brightened up. When I started to rejoice, when I started to be glad, that's when it was, was things began to shift. And so many times in, in so many things that we're facing, so often that the turnaround and the shift begins when we choose to stop being down, stop being sad, stop being depressed, and start choosing to be joyful, to be glad, to seek God, find out what He wants. That is what will turn it around. I like how that verse said that it's a, it's a medicine. And in the ancient Hebrew, it said a lifting high of something the lifting of an illness. And friend, things that try to hurt you can be lifted through a merry heart, through joy and rejoicing, problems and, and challenges and addictions and sicknesses. And these things will be lifted off of our lives as we uh, choose to rejoice, choose to be glad. So often, so many times, in so many situations, a merry heart. Joy is the cure. It's the thing that begins to shift the situation and turn things around. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you showed us uh, on these broadcasts about walking in joy. And Lord, we, we reaffirm our faith and ask you again, help us in the days ahead to walk in new levels of joy. Now, Father, I release my faith today over everybody watching the broadcast, any of them that are dealing with grief, depression, sorrow, whatever it may be. Lord, I thank you that you are moving in their behalf, helping them to make the choice to rejoice, helping them to choose to be glad. And I declare over their life that they are coming out of grief they are coming out of depression. They are coming out of sorrow. And they are entering into new levels of your joy that they've never experienced before. And Father, I do thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, thank you so much for watching the broadcast. Now, don't forget to come back next time because we're going to be starting a brand new series. I don't know what it is yet, but it's going to be good. So don't forget to join us. We'll see you then. Today's broadcast was made possible by the partners of Matthew Alaria Ministries. Go to mam.tv to become a partner today.